If you have your Bibles this morning and um, you don't have an outline, so look at your neighbor and say, I got to go to work. You're going to have to write it out yourself. So get a piece of paper, grab an old bulletin, uh, pull something out. So I'm going to give you an, uh, an outline that I've got, but uh, there won't be anything on the screen. I'm going to make you work for it today. And all God's people said, amen. Grab your Bibles and, and go to the book of Psalms. Go to the book of Psalms. Um, I preached this text in a different way last time, but I'm going to preach a text to you this morning, and it's in Psalm 66, and I want us to look at it from a, from a patriotic position, how God has blessed us. Would you agree that God has blessed America? When I tell you that I've seen people with no water, I mean that. When I tell you I've seen people starving, I mean that. I, think, I see David over here. David's been to Russia. When you want to see, I mean, Marvin, Melvin, Milton, that guy over there, <laughs> glorious husband. When, when we talk about suppression, you and I have seen it. Uh, you and I do not realize how blessed we are as a people living in this great land called America. To be able to get up and enjoy the fruit of the land, the food, the water, to get up and enjoy the, the pleasures of the land and enjoy your life and the freedom to go to and fro. God has done a good thing for America, and all God's people said. But there's a story in the book of Psalm 66 where God did a good thing there for them too. Matt, if you get a chance, go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel talks about in the beginning where God had blessed the nation of Israel and they turned their back on God, and God sent them into the captivity. America's quickly on the cliff. America's already fallen off the cliff. She's not heading to the cliff. She's falling off the cliff. We're just waiting for the landing. And we've not landed yet. And when the landing comes, it's going to be severe, it's going to be sharp, and it's going to be devastating. No nation can stand the way we have stood knowing the blessing of God and rejecting His grace and mercy. So I want to talk to you about what God has done for America and what God has done for Israel, but what God has done for you. Psalm 66, will you please stand? And let us read several verses, 1 through 7. Verse 1, Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of His name. Make His praise as glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works through your greatness and your power your enemies shall submit themselves to you all the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you they shall sing praises to your name come come see the work of God he is what say that word by the way by the way when you read that word awesome it's translated and it's really translated poorly you know what there is no word to describe how good God is we can't describe how, but we're going to use the best word we can. God, you are awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. He turned the sea to dry land. They went through the river. They went through the river on foot. There they were rejoicing him. He rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nation. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. Oh God, you people, bless the Lord. And make his voice pleasant to be heard. Who, who keep our soul amongst the living and does not our, allow our feet to be moved. For you, O oh God, have tested us. Now watch. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid a foundation, uh, an affliction on our back. You've caused men to rise up over our heads. We went through fire. We went through water. But I got good news for you. Ready? In spite of all that, but you have brought us out to rich fulfillment. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Father, I pray you give us ears to hear, a heart to receive, and just a bold faith in the gospel of Jesus. For the gospel is our strength. Paul says there is no other gospel. And Father, Lord, if we were to preach and teach any other gospel, apart from Christ raised from the dead, that, that Father, we'd be cursed. So, Father, we preach no other gospel. That Christ raised from the dead. His blood being our atonement. Father, I pray you give us ears to hear. 
a heart to receive it, and a bold faith to live it out. Of course, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Look at your neighbor say, I love you. You may be seated. I, uh, I wrote down a title for my message, and I changed it this morning. I changed it this morning. I changed one word in my, uh, in my outline. And here's my title of my outline. Our God is an awesome God. How many remember that song? Remember there used to be a song? How our God is an awesome God. Let me read it again. Our God is an awesome God. How many like that title? It's wrong. Theologically, it's wrong. Doctrinally, it's wrong. Here's what it should say. Our God is the awesome God. He's just not a awesome God. He is the awesome God. There's none beside him. There's none above him. There's none below him. There's none beneath him. He is the living God, and there is no other. And all God's people said, we serve the living God, the awesome God, just not a God amongst others. So I titled my message, Our God is is an awesome God, and I scratched out the word and and put the word the. Because I want to make sure I understand when I preach the word of God this morning. I'm not preaching a God. I'm preaching the God, the one and only. Jesus said you must be born again. Only one way to be saved. And that's through the life and the death and the burial of the Lord Jesus. As I begin to read Psalm 66, something comes to my uh, my word comes to my mind, that, that word awesomeness. Matter of fact, look at verse 8, talk about awesomeness. Can you actually say awesomeness when chapter 66, verse 8 and 12? Let, let me read verses 8 through 12 for you. And when I read verses 8 through 12 with you, let me ask you at the end of verse 8 through 12, can you say that God is an awesome God? You ready? Oh, bless our God, you people. Make the voice of his praise be heard. He who keeps our souls among the living and not by our feet to be moved. For you, O oh God, have tested us. When you're going through a test, can you say that our God is the awesome God? Look what else he says. When you have refined us as silver is refined. When you're going through the heat of battle, when you're going through the heat of life, can you say our God is the awesome God? Look what he says in verse 11. When he brought us into the net, when you've been trapped, when you've been caught, can you say, my God is the awesome God? Look what he says. He is, uh, you have caused men to rise over our heads. We went through fire and through the water. When you go through the life of fire, when you go through the life of drowning in your own misery, can you say that my God is the awesome God? Look what he says. You caused men to rise over our heads. We went through the fire and through the water, but... And that's what David is saying here. No matter what comes my life, no matter what comes my way, I serve the living God who is the awesome God. And all God's people said, if you do not amen me, I'm going to preach at 3 o'clock. And all God's people said, amen. We're living in a world today that we got a culture that believes in the Lord Jesus as long as it's easy and beneficial but if I read the Word of God as you have read the Word of God when you got saved he never promised you an easy road did he not just on the contrary when you got saved he promised you a rough road he promised you a narrow road he promised you a hard road but it's a road that's leading somewhere where's it leading to eternal life the Bible says so I want to ask you a question as the psalmist began to describe when life is hard and life is difficult I serve an awesome God. He is faithful to meet all my need. So here's what happens. The psalmist begins to dissect something in chapter 66. But I believe he begins it back in 62 and 63. Not 1962 and 63, but chapter 62 and 63. So I want to show you a couple of things that I believe the Word of God kicks out. So he's preaching the nation of Israel. Now he refers to the nation of Israel as the, the city of God, uh, Zion, Jerusalem. And Jerusalem has been blessed, it's been prospered, God has had his hand on her, and she has seen great days. But then again, sin enters the camp, sin enters the nation, and God is going to send them through this fire. God's going to send them through this adversity. God's going to send them through a tough time that he may refine them as what, the Bible says, silver, bringing out the, the quality and the best, getting rid of all the imperfection. And we know what's going to happen 
We see it in Jeremiah. We see it, Ezekiel talks about it. He's now going to send the Assyrian army. He's going to send the Babylonians. He's going to take them into captivity. And during those years of captivity, they have a choice. They can still say that our God is a awesome God. Or they can complain and whine. Guess what they choose? They can choose to complain and whine. But here's the great, I got good news for you. Whether you complain or whether you whine or whether you gripe or whether you argue, guess what he still is? He is still the awesome God. In spite of who you are and what you are and what you think, he's still the awesome God who meets your needs when you don't deserve it. Aren't you glad for grace? Aren't you glad for the gospel? Aren't you glad that Jesus died for our sins? It is by grace that we are saved through faith, not of our works, lest any man should boast. We are all sinners saved by... Is that not an awesome God? Now, don't cheapen God. Don't belittle God. Don't justify your sins. He is awesome whether you're awesome or not. He is faithful when you're not faithful. He is good when you're not good. He is holy when you're not holy. That's the kind of God we serve. And by the way, He is the only God that does that. So I want to show you a couple of things real quickly in the text that he began to talk about. Go down to, uh, I just want to back, go to chapter uh, 62. Just flip back a couple of 62. Here's the psalmist talking about the goodness of God. Chapter 62, number one, God's awesomeness, God's provision, God's goodness, God's grace, God's prov provision, God's awesomeness is my only option. Look, look at chapter 62. Let me just read a couple of verses to you. Look at verse 1. Truly my soul sil uh, silently waits for the Lord. From him comes salvation. He alone is my rock. He alone is my salvation. He alone is my defense, and I shall not be greatly moved. Go down to verse 6, same chapter. He alone is my rock. He alone is my salvation. He alone is my defense. In him I shall not be moved. Go to verse 11. God has spoken once, twice have I heard it, that God, that power belongs to God. Also you, O Lord, belong mercy, for you render to each one according to his works. I love what the psalmist says here, and we as a nation need to do this, and we have lost this long ago. Listen to me very carefully. I unapologetically say this often in our church, and I will say it until I die. And if you want to fire me, I got a U-Haul I can rent tomorrow. God is not blue. God is not red. God is not a libertarian. God is, God, is, God is awesome. And you and I sit as a congregation, we lean one way politically red, and we lean one way politically blue. And sometimes we get in the middle to be as, 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 a, as a libertarian. Let me tell you what, I'm so glad that my awesome God is not a political God. Now, can God get involved in politics? You better hope and pray he does. Does God get involved in the government situation? You better pray he does. Does God take care of our state legislature? You better pray he does. Let me tell you, we need men and women in there that love God, not politics. And I'm just going to step on some thorns real quick, and I'll get, I'm going to get cut, Sloan. I'm going to get cut. When you go to the ballot box, do not, do not vote politically. You don't vote blue. You don't vote red. You, you, you vote platform. What does my political party say politically on the platform? What, is my, what does my political party say about abortion? What does my political party say about the lifestyle that we have said what is right is wrong and what is wrong is right? It got real quiet real quick. So I say amen. amen. See, we're living in a nation where Israel was. They were blessed by God, but then again turned their back on God. And the psalmist says, listen, I have only one option. It is God in his faithfulness. It's God in his goodness. It's God in his mercy. It is God in no other way. Our God is the awesome God. Because he is the awesome God, he's my only option. I, I, I'm not going to lean on Egypt. I, I'm not going to lean on the Syrians. I'm not going to lean on the Babylonians. I'm not going to lean on my money. I'm not going to lean on my family's heritage. I'm not going to lean on my un own understanding. He is my wisdom. He will direct me. How many would believe that we need America like that today? We do. But I'm just going to bring it down here to the bottom shelf so that we can all pick some fruit and eat this morning. 
Not only do we need a political country like that, we need a church like that. We need a church that will stand and say, Lord, you are our only option, Pam. Pam and I say, Lord, if it's not your word, we don't want to do it. Pam, Lindsay and I agree, hey, if it, if, if, it, if it does not stand the word of God, we don't. There is no plan B. See, by the way, many people say, I got a friend of mine right now. I'm trying to share the gospel. Well, I am sharing the gospel with him. He's been, he's been, he's been uh, resistant. He's thinking about it. He's think, I'll, I'll consider it. He's going to think and consider it all the way to hell. And that breaks my heart. He, by the way, I'm going to tell you right quiet. If you're here this morning, you're thinking about coming to Jesus and you're pondering about Jesus, if you were to die and go to hell right now, you know what you're going to do for eternity? Think about that and ponder that for eternity and think, why did I waste it? Why didn't I respond? Why didn't I turn my life over to Jesus? Because you know what? You had other options. The psalmist says in verse 2, verse 7, uh, I'm sorry, verse 8, and verse 11, God is my only option. There is no other plan. Matter of fact, the only option I had is God's Word. By the way, I would encourage you as a believer, I would encourage you as an American, read God's Word. Thy word have I hidden in my heart, but that I may not sin against thee. I'm going to tell you right now. When I was a kid, by the way, I'm not that old. I'm only 60, and all God's people said. Some said, the old Lord, uh, and the others said, he's a goat. I remember growing up when the Bible was in my elementary school classes. I remember Miss Wolf in the second grade that she would pray for us as a teacher. By the way, they still have those teachers out there today. They are there, but they're in the minority. We've taken the, the Bible out of school. We've taken the Bible out of the courts. We've taken the Bible out of the public place. We've taken the Bible out of church. You realize there are churches today that are preaching without the Bible? they got other options. They have other philosophy. Let me tell you what I love what the Word of God says. Listen, we, it's only the Word of God. And you and I as believers, as Americans, need to know the Word of God that we will know where to stand and what to do and what is right and what is wrong. Because we're living in a world today that what used to be right is now wrong. Matter of fact, the Bible says that in the latter day, men will be lovers of themselves. They will exchange the truth for a lie. Welcome to America today. What you and I grew up as older men and women, were, there, there, were, there, were no, there was a foundation there. Now the foundation has been eroded. But basically what's happened to Israel. And the psalmist says, listen, my only hope is in God. My only option is God. My only strength is God. And we need to pour these things into our children, to our grandchildren, to our young men and young women and and, and, and I thank God that we got men and women that they're in the, the political arena. But some of y'all need to run for office. Boy, it got quiet real quick. Some of y'all need to run for dog catcher. You wouldn't probably win that one either, would you? Number one, there's only one option because our God is only one option. Number two, saying in chapter 62, our awesome God is our refuge. Chapter 62, look at verse 7 and 8. You ready? In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my God is, oh, I love that, my refuge is in God. By the way, when it says my refuge is in God, in what? What, 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 characteri what characteristics did he already give God to say he is my refuge? He's talking about his awesomeness. My refuge is in God's ability to meet my needs. And what a wonderful picture we see that every time we read the scripture about the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have what? Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, through him, through him, see there is no option B, it's through him. And because of him, he is my refuge. He is my strength. He is my defender. He is my security. 
When life is hard, where do you run to? When life is difficult, matter of fact, when we read that scripture, when you got the earthquakes, when you got the fires, when you got the tornadoes, let me tell you what, there are some here today, whether you're 16, 13, 39, 59, 99, all of us, some shape, some form, are going through some adversities of life. It's just called life. We're not immune. The question is how are you going to get through it? You're getting through it because it is God's awesomeness that meets your need. Look at verse 8. Trust in Him at all times. Trust in Him when it's easy and smooth. But the Bible says trust Him when? When it's tough and when it's rough. For when it's tough and it's rough, guess what He still is? An awesome God. He is faithful. He is good. He is holy. He is righteous. He is pure. Matter of fact, I love that verse 8. You can trust Him at all times, even when no one else is. Even when it doesn't make sense. Lord, I don't understand. How many, let's be honest, I won't tell on you. How many have ever, asked, how many have ever said, Lord, I just don't know what's going on? Lord, I just don't understand what's going on. God, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've sought and I've sought. And Lord, I, 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 I've, I've, I've gotten in line with your word, but, and yet I'm still having difficulty. I love what he says here. Listen, you are being refined like silver. God's putting the heat on you to find out if you're really going to say, God is an awesome God. He's not being cruel. He's not being mean. He's testing you. He's not tempting you. He's testing. He's going to find out what you're made out of. Let me ask you a question. What are you made out of? Literally, what are you made out of? Is there some grit in your gut? Is there a backbone in you? Is there some stability in you? Is there faith in you? Is there, is there fortitude in you? And if it's there, guess who put it there? The gospel, the greatness of God. And he wants to make that stronger and more dependable that you can lean on, not yourself, but him. So the Bible says our awesomeness is only in his option. Our awesomeness is in his refuge, how he defends us and takes care of us. Number three, I want to show you. Flip over to uh, Psalm 63. You ready? Uh, by the way, I love this. God's awesomeness is our strength. Now, now I, I did a funeral last night, and let me tell you where Mike is today. I did a funeral last night for Amma Jean Cox, and I uh, had a wonderful time. Amma Jean was a part of our church for many years. She was 92 when she passed away. She taught Sunday school in this church for years. She loved the Lord. Uh, she loved me, she loved her church, she loved her Sunday school class, just a sweet lady, and all God's people said. By the way, I'm not making a saint out of her because she had her moments. Amen? But guess what she had? An awesome God. She loved Jesus. So they called me, and we made arrangements. I did that funeral last night from 6 to 8, and then the only time they could get to take care of mom the burial was today at 11 o'clock out in Oak Ridge. And I was coming toward church this morning, and I could not be at the funeral this morning, the graveside, because I have responsibility here, and they understood that. I said, I'm gonna, I got a, a guy, do you mind if I get one of my associate pastors to take care of the graveside? Said, That'd be fine. We'd love. I said, Dr. Uh, Brother Mike Patty, be glad to do it for you. He loves the Lord. I highly reckon. Oh, so Mike called him, and so Mike called He said, I'll take care of it. So Mike is doing the graveside at 11 o'clock. Should be already done. And I got coming to church this morning. I said, praise the Lord, it's raining. And I'm not out there doing a graveside. Mike Patty is. But I know Mike Patty. You know what Mike Patty's doing? He's saying God is an awesome God. You know what Mike Patty's doing this morning? He's taking care of Miss Emma Cox's graveside. You know what Mike Patty's doing this morning? He's giving the word of God. He's preaching the gospel to his family. He's hurting. See, he said, listen, you need a strength that only God can give you. So I sat with that funeral last night, and I told the congregation, this family's grieving. They're rejoicing that Mama loved the Lord. And Mama's with heaven, but they're going to have their first Christmas without Grandma. They're going to have their first Thanksgiving without Grandma. They're going to have their first summer vacation without Grandma. I mean, she was the patriarch. She was the, the glue that kind of held it together. And I'm like, okay, me and my personal wisdom, I'm going to come in there and I'm going to give them what they have. What I, I'm going to give them what they need because of my style and my, and my charm and my good looks. <laughs> By the way, Kathy King sang last night. Roz Jackson sang last night. We got together and I told these young ladies, you're welcome, young ladies. I looked right at them. 
I said, your singing, your singing, and my preaching is not what they need. Because your singing will come up short. Your singing will come up short, and my preaching will come up short. What they need is the Word of God. That's the strength that the psalm is talking about. When all hell breaks loose, God is my strength. He is my refuge. I'm going to trust him and no one else. Would you say that America needs that today? We're trusting anything and everybody along the way, but we're throwing out the word of God. We're throwing out the gospel. We're giving you ready of the, the, the Ten Commandments, and we're saying, Lord, we don't need you. And if you read the text, you read the history of Israel, God began to put them through some fires. And I'm going to tell you right now, we are going through some fires as a nation. And there's more coming. Unless we repent of our sins. So what do I do when I say God is my awesome God? My awesome God, there is no plan B. My awesome God, he is my refuge. My awesome God, he is my strength. It is not based upon a preacher. It's not based upon a politics. It's not based upon a, 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 a denomination. I was so funny last night. I was going to say it last night about Amma Jean Cox. Amma Jean Cox was shared the G. She was shared Jesus with anybody and everybody whenever she could. She had some um, Jehovah Witnesses that would come to her house all the time. They knock on the door. We went, and she said, "Oh, come on in, honey. Let's talk a little bit." Man, she had those Jehovah Witnesses running out the door within 20 minutes. She had them all up. And I thought about her last night. I know the biggest thing is we, it's a convention. We just voted. It's a convention about women in the pulpit and women being ordained. And, you know, as a matter of fact, Saddleback's gone. And I saw Evelation. She Evelation church. So, what? I listen, she, did, she wasn't a preacher, but she could preach. Because she had strength. This woman knew her Bible. She knew her Bible. Let me ask you a question. When all hell breaks loose, do you know your Bible? Do you, do you know where to turn to to give you strength? Do you, do you know where to go to to get refuge, get, get help? Let me give you one more. You ready? And this is my favorite. You ready? Matter of fact, look at, look at chapter 63, verse 1. Oh, God, you are my God. No other option. Early I will seek you. Now, i got to finish up. That word early, you're thinking, well, I'm talking about early in the morning. I believe the context is there because you go down to verse 6, I remember you on my bed, talk about the night. I believe that is the context, but I think it's deeper than that too. So look what's happened. Oh, God, you're, you're my God. Early I will seek you. You should seek the Lord early in the morning. And all God's people said, but you should also seek the Lord early in the midst of your problems. Seek him when you're a young man in your teens. Seek him when you're a young woman in your teen. Seek him as a young man that in his in 20. Seek, but you know, even if you're an old man, somewhere in the middle, even when begin, when life gets hard, turn to him immediately. Don't wait. He said, early I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. There's three words there I want you to do. He said, I seek, I thirst, and I long. You know what he's describing there? Dependence. Lord, I depend on you. Lord, Lord, I thirst for you. Lord, if you don't show up, it ain't going to happen. Psalms 123, you need to read Psalms 123 one day. And I'm going to give you the first two verses. Psalm 23, verse 1, verse 2, they're identical. Same words. He, it's like Mel tell us. He stuttered. Da, 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 da. It's, it's uh, uh, same thing. Here's what Psalms 123, verse 1 says. Oh, Lord, if it weren't for you, where would I be? And it's basically the nation of Israel saying that. Lord, if it weren't for you, where would I be? Oh, God, if it weren't for you, where would I be? It's time for America to say that. Oh, God, if it weren't for you, we would not be the great land we are today. If it weren't for the Christian faith, we wouldn't be the nation we are today. Lord, if it weren't for you, I would not have the marriage I have today. Lord, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have the blessings I have today. Lord, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have the job I have today. Lord, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have the health 
I have today. Lord, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have the opportunity. You know, one thing that baffles me, and I just thank God for his awesomeness, why was I not born on a different continent? Why, why was I not born in a different land? But I was born on this land, America. Isn't God awesome? He is so awesome. He has blessed you. But I love him. He said, listen, I will seek you. I will thirst for you. I will long for you. Now watch, and I'll close. Psalm 63, verse 1. In dry and thirsty lands where there is no water. Lord, when it's tough and there is no, I'm thirsty and there is no water. You know what he's describing there? Difficult times. When it is difficult, I'm going to seek you. When it is difficult, I'm going to thirst for you. When it's difficult, I'm going to long for you. Our God is the awesome God. This morning, you and I have been blessed to live in this great land called America. But can I just wrap it up, what it's really all about? You and I live in a great place called Grace. You and I live in a great place called Calvary. You and I live in a great place called the gospel. Aren't you so glad that God extended his grace and mercy to you when you were lost? He loved you. When everybody gave up on you, he didn't. When everyone threw you away, he came looking for you. If, listen, this morning, you know why God is an awesome God? He saved a wretched soul like you. All God's people said, think about it, think about it. Stop being so holier than thou. I'm better than Alvin Thornton, and I'm better than Sloan, and I'm definitely better than Terry Snyder. But let me tell you what, you're comparing yourself to something that's not very much. Because neither one of those are very much. Neither am I. The only thing that makes Alvin Thornton and Sloan and Terry worthy is the awesomeness of God. If you have nothing else to do, thank the Lord for your salvation. Thank the Lord for this great country called America. Give thanks. Father, thank you today. We love you and bless you, Lord, for the word of God. Father, I thank you, Lord. The Bible says every word of God is true. Father, Lord, we can trust you. We can depend on you. We can lean on you. We can quote you. You are our strength. You are our refuge. You are our focus. Early in our problems, we're going to turn to you. Early in our lives, we're going to praise you. Early in the morning, we're going to have joy. Father, early in life, early in the beginning, God, we ask God that you do for us what only you can do. Father, forgive our nation. Forgive our leaders. Forgive us in our voting. Father, Lord, oftentimes we vote according to our pocketbook. Let's just call it what it is. Father, times we vote based upon a personality, a charm. Oh, God, forgive us. Father, I pray we vote on the word of God. Father, Lord, we vote Jesus. <laughs> we thank you for this great nation. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus is Lord. He is the awesome Lord. Again, Father, have your way. Of course, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you please stand?